somewhat repetitive and I'll try and keep that to a minimum. Uh, in terms of where I fit in this conversation on uh, green infrastructure uh, is really at the intersection of the private sector and technology innovation. And what I will do is uh, connect the dots a little bit. So uh, as part of my intro, uh, I do corporate water strategy work for US and non-US multinationals. Uh, I have also worked for FEMSA Foundation. Uh, I continue to work for Inter-American Development Bank, uh, in particular on the innovation side, uh, and spent a lot of time with uh, innovative technology companies that are focused on water solutions from both the scarcity and the quality side and equity and uh, access. So uh, this all really does uh, intersect, I think, pretty nicely in terms of what this trend is around nature-based solutions and how do we scale solutions at speed? Uh, because I think we can all appreciate that uh, we really don't have time to waste. So with that, uh, I met Jonathan uh, at Stockholm World Water Week. And we had a discussion of uh, on this paper that I authored for uh, IDB on the case for green infrastructure uh, in uh, Latin America. And just as a framework, it's, it's still relevant uh, for this discussion uh, and talk a little bit about uh, climate bonds, water development projects, how they fit. Uh, key components uh, have to be compliance with mitigation, obviously. Uh, and unfortunately, compliance with adaptation and resiliency, which is becoming really more of the trend. Uh, some of the key pieces here uh, in terms of uh, allocation, governance, technical uh, diagnosis, uh, and I'll come to that later in the presentation in terms of the role of uh, technologies in delivering quantitative performance, uh, which ties back to how do we increase investment in nature-based solutions. Uh, so the case uh, for green infrastructure, uh, in my mind and the minds of many, is that it really is compelling, uh, even more so now, uh, as we look at how traditional infrastructure is so underfunded, uh, it's aging, uh, it's certainly not resilient. So as we think about what 21st century infrastructure should be, it really should be green and it should be a hybrid also uh, in many instances. So really have to understand the connection between uh, nexus issues, energy, water, and food. Uh, we need a strong business case for green infrastructure. And I believe we're at the point now where we have technologies that can help us support that business case, which is becoming ever more important for the private sector. Uh, there's a lot of education and awareness that has to be done in terms of what's the value of green infrastructure uh, multiple purposes, benefits, uh, obviously, uh, you know, incorporating green blue thinking into all aspects of, uh, the urban environment, uh, and watersheds is critical, uh, and really thinking about non-conventional, uh, not last century or century before, uh, infrastructure is, is key, uh, I would say particular in the water sector. Uh, Advantages, and there certainly are some challenges, but again, I believe we're in a position to really address those. Obviously, advantages, no finite life expectancy. Uh, they're low cost, uh, provide effective water treatment solutions. Uh, the benefits can increase over time. They're self-maintaining. Uh, they operate 24 seven, which is an amazing gift considering what uh, operation and maintenance costs can be with traditional infrastructure. Uh, some of the challenges, and, and they were touched on uh, with the prior speakers, uh, we really do need a compelling business case. And, you know, ultimately, to get the private sector engaged, uh, we need to quantify that. What is the ROI? Uh, how do we get more investors engaged? Again, it's really quantifying uh, the return on investment for nature-based solutions, which is uh, quite a bit different than traditional infrastructure. Uh, in terms of uh, financing mechanisms, uh, again, I focus on the corporate side, um, but obviously uh, governments, uh, multinational banks uh, are key participants. Uh, the types, self-explanatory in terms of what's available and, and some of the case studies uh, that were presented prior touched on this. But on the water side, it's, you know, water collection, how do we 
collect water, uh, move water, uh, store it, treat it uh, in the uh, world of uh, increasing impacts from climate change. Uh, flood protection and drought resilience are key. I live in the American West and we're seeing uh, the aridification of the American West. It's not a drought, it is permanent uh, going forward. So really rethinking what sort of infrastructure we need is, is really critical for us to maintain uh, economic development, uh, business growth, social uh, well-being, uh, and healthy ecosystems. Uh, I want to touch on some of the work that uh, Pepsi has been doing. I, I find that what they've been focused on over the past several years is interesting. Uh, also, companies such as AB InBev um, are interesting in terms of how they are lining up their corporate water stewardship programs with uh, green bonds uh, and investments in funds. So this is um, Pepsi's narrative around their water stewardship strategy, their corporate water strategy. Uh, they talk about being water positive from a uh, footprint perspective, but also what role can they play in terms of scaling solutions. Uh, the Future of Water Fund is a fund that uh, I launched last year. It's focused on uh, venture stage water tech, innovative water technology companies. And Pepsi was a founding um, investor in that fund. So really thinking about the role of the corporation in not just reducing their water footprint, but also participating in venture funds to identify innovative technology solutions. Uh, they've got a, a long history of um, green bonds. Uh, over the past several years. Uh, their focus has been on uh, decarbonization, climate resilience uh, in their operations, but across their value chain. So in watersheds and supply chain, uh, pursuing a net positive water impact through investments uh, and regenerative agriculture. So again, Lizzie talked about the role of the private sector. And I think this is a really good example of how a corporation is thinking about the pledges and the commitments that they've made uh, in sustainability at large, but also water in particular, and how they can start putting capital into uh, the vehicles that have a uh, more uh, sustainable and resilient uh, impact over time. Uh, this is their progress over time. This was uh, released at the end of last year. Uh, just draw your attention to uh, the third item, uh, water use efficiency. Uh, again, this is very focused on uh, how can they um, reduce their water use uh, that takes the stress off of uh, watersheds and supply chains and communities. So again, uh, really an interesting use of their green bond uh, fund uh, and the intersection of things like climate change, water, uh, and technology. I, I could go on about this, for quite a while, but the biggest trend in the world of water right now from an innovation perspective is uh, the rise of digital technologies. And what I mean by that is the ability to collect data, water quantity, water quality on a real-time basis, also have the ability to forecast performance within a watershed. And these are just some of the companies that are out there uh, ranging from satellite data acquisition and analytics to uh, aggregating publicly available data, hydraulic modeling, uh, and climate modeling. And what I'm seeing in the world of water from uh, the private sector right now is that they're focused on their role in creating and maintaining healthy watersheds. And if you think about what that means, it means how can a corporation not just reduce their water footprint, but really make investments in natural infrastructure, uh, supply chain communities and determine on a quantitative basis the impact of their investment to really accelerate uh, more investments in healthy watersheds and communities. So we do have a uh, more sustainable and resilient uh, society and uh, ecosystems. 